Um, I have the great pleasure of being able to introduce Dr. Rupali Chada. She, we were so blessed at our CFRW um, district event to be able to hear her message and so excited that she had some time to come <clears throat> and spend it with us. And so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a background on this amazing woman. Um, Dr. Chada is a Johns Hopkins trained double board certified physician who practices in the field of general and forensic psychiatric medicine. She treats patients, works as an expert witness for the courts, and also in healthcare policy reform. The practice of medicine is no longer in the hands of physicians, but instead venture capitalists and corporations make life or death decisions as they inflate costs, minimize actual healthcare provided, and harm the doctor patient relationship. So, healthcare has been replaced by sick care and our government has enabled this corporate takeover of our health in dubious um, irresponsible legislation. Dr. Chada worked with President Trump to tackle this problem and continues her work to promote free market solutions that put doctors and patients back in charge of their health. Dr. Chada has a passion for how the body and mind work together to produce a healthy human in <clears throat> working to heal the mind, she has observed how significant a fact culture in terms of making people unhealthy and has wrestled with the question, who diagnoses a sick culture? This question has made her realize that virtually no one in the medical field was applying their knowledge beyond the individual. Consequently, the people who drive cultural changes have done so independently and oblivious to individual human health. This observation resulted in her critique of feminism, i.e. that is largely misdiagnosed the problems and its prescriptions and making people sicker. Amen, sister. Uh, Dr. Chada is working hard to formulate not just a critique of feminism, but a response, a path forward by reimagining and unearthing what is to be healthy, to be a healthy, resilient, well-functioning woman. It is my pleasure <laughs> to introduce Dr. Chada that I've gotten to know so well. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna actually use my computer um, as a guide just because, so the world that we live in is actually really complicated and almost too complicated for us to understand. Our brains are designed to filter information that's relevant and that which isn't. For example, before I mentioned it right now, how many of you were feeling the clothing on your skin or smelling the food around you or noticing the temperature in the room? What you were focusing on was me. So what your brain automatically is doing is prioritizing information for you. We also do this with non-physical stimuli particularly narrative stories. Stories reduce our very, very complex environment into a consumable form. This helps us learn how to behave successfully. Often stories tell us lessons in morality and social norms, folk wisdom and warnings. They're handed down generation to generation to help us store cultural wisdom. The most famous story we have is the hero myth. Um, the hero, heroic story is fundamentally a story about how to succeed in the world. Every culture has heroic narratives and values that the culture uh, thinks are important are embodied in these popular and enduring stories. The hero is traditionally male and his story is appropriately masculine. There is a heroine story, but it is appropriately feminine. As society grew more complex, the masculine hero myth expanded, but the feminine didn't. And it was for a really, really good reason. People like to have sex and sex leads to babies. And so um, the feminine story remained constrained to motherhood. <coughs> Thus the maiden mother matriarch triad was born and masculine stories continued to grow and develop. So narrow, a narrow feminine story and an expansive masculine story has been sufficient for every culture in the world to manage the problems they faced. America was particularly successful, but something has changed. And now we have new problems and we're struggling to solve them. 
our stories and the cultural institutions um, that derive from those stories are no longer sufficient. So what happened? So what happened was prosperity, liberty, and birth control. Wealth and technology unimaginable to our ancestors, combined with a free society, produced a new set of problems. Reliable birth control in the 1960s was the big catalyst. All of a sudden, women were no longer constrained to the maiden mother matriarch triad, but unlike men, they didn't have stories to help them navigate a complex new world with new roles. People simply assumed that more prosperity um, would just be a band-aid and lead, lead to solutions and didn't realize that we needed to actually address what were the new problems that emerged and how can we help ladies in the generations below us. So the purpose of this talk is to illustrate the nature of these problems and their solutions and to show that their solutions are found in the underdeveloped narratives of the heroic feminine and that this heroic story is found scattered throughout many of our cultural and religious texts and that the first and only major development of the heroic femi feminine was actually in the United States during the 19th century. So feminism could have solved these problems. Um, they could have developed stories for the feminine by looking at history, at religion, at cultures around the world, and helping women navigate the brave new world we found ourselves in. But sadly, they did not. Instead, they said, let's scrap the feminine all together, and even the narrow few stories that we had, um, and women can solve this new problem of complexity by just enacting masculine stories. They were either too busy reading Marxism, or were just too lazy, to, um, to formulate anything, and we ended up telling women to be masculine only. But if men are enacting out masculine stories of the hero, which is now primarily building a career, and women are also enacting out the masculine stories, who is enacting out the feminine? No one. And what is the consequence of no one acting out the feminine? Well, no or fewer babies, but what else? And I'm going to prove in this talk that also inequality, big government, and who knows what else because the feminine story is so underdeveloped. So I'm going to start with the most conse consequential problem first, which is the total collapse of American fertility. For all of human history, as I mentioned, people have been good at two things, and you know that's having sex and having babies. And <laughs> now many of us who even want babies cannot have them. We're not having sex anymore. 40% of adults under 30 in Japan are virgins, and a similar effect is happening here in the United States. Even for those who are having sex, they're having less of it, but with more partners, and less satisfaction, and obviously that has a moral consequence. Um, but in addition to that, if women continue to find uh, engagement with men less satisfying, then it's easier for them to stay in the feminist narrative and not make efforts to couple with men. And you may have seen this with your daughters and granddaughters that it's harder and harder for people to, like for even sons and grandsons, for people to couple off and get married. Um, men and women are increasingly alienated from one another and even hostile. And the biological decline is perhaps the most worrisome. So ladies, we know we have a biological clock and it doesn't tick forever. But what we don't talk about now is that men have one too. Male fertility is falling off a cliff. It used to be that male fertility was essentially forever. But tragically, male testosterone levels, which are needed to produce healthy sperm, have declined 1% per year since 1982. Um, we tragically um, restore our men's testosterone with giving them testosterone like in a pill or an injection form, but that further reduces their ability to make their own testosterone. 26% of men who are seeking treatment for erectile dysfunction are now under 40 years of age, when in the past that was virtually zero. Sperm counts have fallen by 50% in the last two decades, and not only are sperm counts or actual sperm per ejaculate low, but the sperm themselves have poor shape, poor motility, um, which you know is needed for them to be aerodynamic, and they have genetic abnormalities in the DNA that they carry, which will you know likely lead to miscarriage or other problems. So this is all doom and gloom. Modern medicine is amazing. 
we can now take an egg from a woman and sperm from a man and put it into a uterus that the egg didn't even come from. Um, it doesn't mean that there aren't still problems. Because of these advancements, we sometimes think that our fertility no longer has a biological clock attached to it. But a 20-year-old woman now is less fertile than her grandmother was at 35. Women now have diminished ovarian reserve, less eggs, lower quality eggs than expected for her age, and the risk of miscarriage has gone up for women of all ages. So we're more and more exposed to environmental toxins, and this is partly the reason why, as our world has industrialized, um, there are endocrine disrupting chemicals in our cleaning products, in the building materials in homes, in our makeup, in our toiletries, and over-the-counter medicines and supplements, in our processed food. We also have plastic everywhere, and plastics contain a compound called phthalates which disrupt fertility in both genders, so it affects sons and grandsons too. Birth control may make the situation even more murky. So as I mentioned, reliable birth control was seen as a boon for most women, and not all women want to go back to not having um, other roles available to them. Although some women do prefer um, marriage and motherhood alone, and that's totally awesome too. But here again, we can't escape our biology. Birth control is mostly hormonal, and um, like aside from a copper IUD or male contraception, and hormones don't just affect you, they are you. We have receptors for hormones in every single organ, including our brains, and when we manipulate hormones with the pill or non-copper IUDs, we're, we are not just putting a halt on ovulation. As a psychiatric physician, I often tell my patients that the medicines I prescribe don't just go to their brain. They can go anywhere in their body, and that's how we get side effects, not just the effect that we want. So there are very few, with rare exceptions, targeted pharmaceuticals. And female sex hormones influence many things. And I'm sure a lot of ladies can attest here. So of course they influence who do we decide to have sex with, how we feel and interpret stress, how hungry we feel, our mood, um, our aggression, who we select as friends, let alone a husband. So we can look at brain scans now and see that um, not only is a woman on hormonal birth control or even hormone replacement therapy for ladies who are using um, Premarin or things like that, um, their brains are structurally different for women who never ever took the pill, but they're also functionally different, meaning different areas in the brain light up with different stimuli. And so cortisol or stress hormone um, actually reacts differently when you're on birth control or HRT. So women on the pill do not have the same spike to the same stressor. So imagine a bear is coming at you. You're gonna have a different spike of cortisol, different areas of your brain light up. And that basically means that women then do not assess stressful, meaningful, and even potentially dangerous situations appropriately. So the implications of hormonal birth control affect who we choose to marry, the divorce rate. So I don't know if, if you've ever heard of this research or data, but a lot there is actually robust data on this, that women, when they get married, if they come off birth control to have children, they can find that their husband smells different to them, and this is actually correlated with divorce. So, because um, smell is really important, and there's a genetic reason for why it actually tells us that we have different immune systems than our spouse, which is good for the next generation. Um, hormonal birth control, there's also studies to show this, affect men's achievement. So the, the data supports that men's achievement and women's sexual standards are highly correlated. It also will determine what career a woman might choose, because remember the stress response. So you can see how it's really affecting a lot of things, not just preventing babies. And so here's a real shocker. We have known about this information for decades, sometimes 50 or 60 years. So why didn't anyone care? Fertility has always been in the feminine domain. The masculine rarely has ever talked about it. So if you relegate feminine stories to unimportant, like the feminists did, then the concerns go with it. So no one was paying attention, and women were taught to be masculine, and men were taught to be masculine until recently, and no one was taught about the feminine. 
So now I want to give you a little bit of history why America is so awesome and what we were embar uh, embarking on and maybe an idea for us to move forward. America was a unique place for women as only here women had a parallel power structure that was complementing the masculine government embodied in what's called the women's civic movement. During the 19th century, new rules emerged for women, but they were squashed by the progressives and suspiciously ignored by the feminists. The women's civic movement comprised of women's voluntary associations um, from the birth of our country until the 1920s and allowed women to exercise a public role. And actually, clubs like this are remnants <coughs> of the women's civic movement. Um, and women participated, um, it removed the constraints on women's participation in like traditional institutions like government, religious structures, or higher education. So there were three general types of these in, um, institutions, um, religious, self-improvement, and community improvement. And the group started originally by wealthy women, often religious, with the intent to bring the morality of the Christian home into the public arena, and heavily focused on charity, but expanded rapidly over the decades to include women working side by side of all socioeconomic status and even race in America. These groups taught women how to organize, how to perform administrative functions, budget money, on large scales, even during the Civil War, how to master public speaking, deal with politicians, affect policy change, and stir up social awareness and education. They provided charity, education, industry quality standards for things like food. So uh, I don't know if you know the history of milk standards in our country, but um, moms basically got upset that once America started industrializing and we were on the farm, that the milk that their kids were receiving weren't, wasn't 100% milk, that it was adulterated. So industry standards in healthcare, medicine, and food were started by women in our country. So at this time, the United States was the, if not the most, um, literate and well-educated countries in the world. And a lot of what the women's civic organizations did was better than what the government would later provide. So the further development of this feminine domain was squashed, as I mentioned in the progressive era, primarily due to moral panic and sexism, the fear that women would not stay home and have babies. Hence, the left, the same left that we have now, which is now the radical left, has the government take over many functions and services provided by women's organizations, heralding the modern age of necessary big government. In fact, this emerging feminine domain was proof that we did not need big government. By the end of World War II, a new situation emerged. As a women's civic organization movement started to die because they were taken over by, you know, if you have government providing schools and government providing social welfare and government providing assistance for new immigrants, women didn't have that role anymore. So women standing in society diminished. And discontent emerged, but our economic dominance masked that discontent. So this is where stories come in and are so important. So in the 1950s, something unique happened. We took that lifestyle, which was again the economic, um, I guess, you know, dominance of the time after World War II. Um, we took that lifestyle of women being at home, being the homemaker, and we put it on TV which is again the story. So we normalize this in a very, very powerful way. Women went now from having a unique and fulfilling parallel role to men in society at the turn of the 20th century to being relegated to the home sphere exclusively. So this is, because I always wonder why, why feminism in America? Like why did feminism emerge in the Islamic world? <coughs> or like in another, other countries where women face even more oppression? Um, so this is my, Theory. So enter feminism. Feminism claimed that the problem was that motherhood and family were fundamentally oppressive to women. That was a lie. The actual problem was the loss of this feminine power structure combined with post-world, post-war prosperity left a generation of women feeling diminished compared to their grandmothers. What feminism failed to do was explain or explore what the civic women's organizations were doing, and basically they were creating new feminine patterns of behavior, new archetypes, and new stories, a new model of how to succeed. 
So some people will claim that leadership itself is a masculine quality, which makes me wonder they've tragically never met their mothers. <laughs> so, <laughs> this pattern of leadership was never fully developed because women primarily took the ro roles of marriage and motherhood, so their leadership presence was considered outside of that role. And feminism never seriously addressed um, this because, of course, they decided there was only one good pattern of behavior, which was the masculine. And so they said that the feminine pattern of behavior was weak, it was deficient. In the United States, men did not do this to us ladies, feminists did. Um, and so this framing has consequences. And I, I love that conservative women recognize that feminism maybe had drawbacks and wasn't all good, maybe was even toxic in some ways. So I'm gonna talk about the consequences and then going to give you guys some homework of what to do so we can try to repair some of this. So the consequences, like, let's take a look at that. Um, women today, as a result, um, have faced issues that their moms and grandmothers have not. A young woman may go to college and then maybe graduate school. If she was a man, she would be rewarded for that achievement with wife and children, a family, if she wanted. A woman who engages in this masculine pattern of behavior does not get the same reward as a man. And that's pretty messed up that we don't tell this women this basic truth. We continue operating on the feminist narrative that the masculine is the only good way, the only way. So we create generations of women who enacted the masculine only to see their opportunities for marriage and motherhood diminish. And you can see that people are having so much, so much difficulty in coupling up and, and having families. So our current version of feminism, unfortunately, is very adversarial. It's rooted in the ideas of Marxism, which is it has to be an oppressor and oppressed. So this kind of stops the conversation right there, and that's a big issue. Women have a biological reality, but how come no one caters to this? Why is there no childcare in colleges, even Christian colleges? Could academic institutions allow women to enter school later? Because remember, we do have fertility falling off the cliff. So what if we built a society where women entered school a little bit later if they wanted to be moms, and then we fast track them? Because a mom of three or four has a lot more skills than I had at 20 going into college. So we should use those skills and, and highlight them. What if businesses did this, or allowed women to work from home more, which we've seen during COVID, actually work from home works better in many industries especially for women and mothers. My, my sister has two kids under three, and you know she, she's able to work at home and take care of them, which was not a reality before. Um, so by telling women, career women, that they're exactly the same as men, we're promising the same, them the same rewards, and that's a lie. This lie has created a perpetual feeling of failure in women who have delayed and deferred marriage and motherhood while in school or to advance a career. But we have also created these feelings of failure when a woman is expected to be a superwoman, juggling children in a career without any institutional or extended family support with a smile on her face. <coughs> the truth is that neither men nor women can have it all. We need each other, and certainly not at the same time. We need to support each other, and we need to love each other. Our culture should reflect that dynamic and so that our stories should be where we need to start. If we want a free and prosperous society where men and women aren't in competition, but complement one another to the better of each, then we must see our cultural inheritance, we must search our cultural inheritance for these stories of the heroic feminine, as we have done with the masculine. Only then can we figure out how to prioritize family and work, balance the relative status of men and women, old and young, rich and poor, address our health and lifestyle issues that are leading to fertility problems and our shared cultural ambitions. The problem we have today will not be solved by bitter academics and the resentful theories. I, I don't know if any of you have even read what third wave, third wave feminism says, uh, but will be by recommitting to that cultural inheritance that we've been ignoring for so many decades. So my charge to all of you is that you may have kids, you may have grandkids, and it doesn't matter if they're 
so the, the mask, all of us have some masculine traits and some feminine traits. You know, it's about the balance, and men usually have more masculine traits, and ladies usually have more feminine. But my charge to you is to start giving a different narrative. You know, so many times I talk to girls, I'm in my 40s, I talk to women in their 20s, and they just say marriage and motherhood is gross, or I'm gonna do it when I'm 30, or I'm gonna do it later, or I don't know, my career is more important. And if that is truly what they believe, and they want to, like, I'm a physician, obviously I worked hard on my career, do it. But we need to be honest and have a fair conversation about what that means. There's no way that we can just keep lying to ladies and say that they can, um, you know, focus on their career and then magically at 35, when they're right on the cusp of advanced maternal age, by the way, which is now we're thinking about dropping it to 32, um, that, a, that a husband will appear because men and women don't even know how to relate to one another anymore. So start by shifting the narrative yourself and start for searching for stories of women who um, have enacted successful roles, who have been able to balance. How did they balance? Did they have community centers? Did they have church centers? Did they have, what kind of support did they have? How did they accomplish this? And to not put on this, you know, Pinterest, Instagram, fake, like, I'm a super mom, everything's great, and I also am a CEO of a company. Like, if you are, there's a lot of people behind you, and we need to start helping other ladies see the reality and work together. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I have so many questions for you, but it's not all about me um, because I have a mother of three and I have two daughters. One 25 and 120, so I, I can spend the whole night. Does anybody, does anybody have any questions? I'm the Q&A gal. I'm reminded of the movie Nine to Five. Strong women. A man who they really put under their thumb, but more importantly, variable hours. Uh, they had child care. They had people who could work from home. That's the kind of thing you're talking about. Absolutely. And um, I have a friend. She's a college professor in her 20s, so quite accomplished for such a young age. And one of her professors told her, an anthropology professor, that there's no such thing as a biological clock. So this is like the kind of messaging we're receiving rather than, hey, let's support you. You know, if you do decide to be a mom and we're getting the opposite messaging. Yeah. How do you get, you're, 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 <laughs> the question is, how do you get men on board with this? Because we can run around and tell everybody all the stories we want. Yes. But men are standing here saying, here's the glass ceiling, stay down there. <laughs> well, I think it's so. I think it's been, so, so. Well, you have to tie it into how this affects them. So a lot, most, I will tell you, I, I talk a lot to young people, and men do not want to get married. They have no financial incentive to do that. They have no real even emotional incentive they think but they if you're not married the studies show even if you're in a bad marriage you actually live longer and you live healthier <laughs> so we have kind of like removed to this and we can't even with a doctrina men feel like well she's just gonna change her mind and leave so this is not an easy fix women have created the problem too by treating men as they're a little disposable so um, I think the more we hear them and their concerns and say, tell us why marriage is not an option or why, or why do you feel this way, I think that we'll start to repair the relationship. It's not going to happen globally or for our whole American society, but one by one, we can start shifting that narrative. I'd be, I'd be interested to know how many women, how many women of our generations collectively in this room actually sat down with our daughters and said, here's a couple of paths you can choose as you grow older. You can choose to be a mom and a, and a wife. You can choose to be a CEO or, you know, entrepreneur, or you can choose something in the middle. But how many of us did really took the time to go have that conversation and, and work through the options and what what the 
the consequences of each choice is. I, I have a feeling that doesn't happen very much. And a lot of it's because at the time we would do it, our daughters don't, don't want to talk to us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you have a good point. But still, it's important. Yeah. Even on the right side, you know, those of us that are, I mean, there's not, society has changed so much, you, it's kind of hard to call yourself a conservative because you don't want to conserve what's happening right now. But if you're on the right, um, you, even those of us ladies on the right, we've kind of imbibed this message from feminism that um, that there's this adversarial relationship and we're gonna get screwed. My mom has a PhD in political science. When she moved, to, my mom and dad moved to Canada and then San Diego, my mom quit working to raise her kids because she was in a foreign country. And I was like grateful to have my mom at home. And then I went to school to our like leftist indoctrination camps, right? <laughs> and I started looking at my mom like she was like, gross or something like why did she do that and now obviously I realize like wow that was amazing that my mom made that sacrifice for us but yes I am sure teenage daughters do not want to have these kinds of conversations but they will be grateful one day that we did questions I have I have a question yes um I after having two daughters and now I have my son who is in eighth grade um, I think one of the things that is so difficult for our boys is they're bombarded with these messages of toxic masculinity, which, I mean, if I was a 14, 15 year old boy, I'm sure that that would probably affect my sperm count as well. Like, you know, I mean, so how, what do we do for our sons that you still want them to be empathetic and you want them to search for a partner that they want to partner with and support and you know build into but yet how, how do they how do they be men I mean, that's the thing that for the young men right now i think it's so difficult for them to just be men yeah it's, it's true because not only has femininity been relegated to like weak and deficient but masculinity has been relegated to toxic and that's not true. So, you know, everyone has some masculine and feminine, as I mentioned. And what are some masculine traits? So maybe start having these kinds of conversations, like, you know, um, building wealth, um, organizational skills, and what are feminine traits? Like, you know, the feminine actually traditionally takes the wealth that's created by the masculine and make sure that no one's left behind and make sure that everyone's taken care of. And these are complementary traits. And like I said, women have some masculine traits. I mean, when I go to work, I treat prison inmates um, on a day-to-day -day basis, so I can't, you know, be like, oh, I'm very like soft or anything like that at all. Um, but to tell little boys that <clears throat> that even if they feel like aggression, like for example, is aggression a bad thing? Well, what if you're having to fight like a, a, an invader or fight for what's morally right? Like we conflate good and nice so much in our society because I believe God never told us to be nice. He told us to be good. And so start having those types of conversations. There are a lot of social media pages, and I know kids are always online. There's one one that's for older boys and men called Proud Masculinity on Instagram. So people are starting to have this conversation push back because you know I'm very thankful that the men in my life have loved and protected me. and. You know, we have a, someone coming into my house, my only equalizer is my gun. Other than that, I'm, you know, pushing my husband to the door, like, you go ahead to live, and I'm grateful for that. So we have to talk about their, their positive roles in society. I just have a statement as far as uh, the comment about the two paths for a young lady to go for a career or maybe not and, and look for marriage early and raising wonderful children. I think the push today is coming from the fact that the young lady needs to be financially independent. Mm -hmm. Not to be the CEO, but to have a skill that down the line she can take care of herself. If she does become a mother with children uh, and there's no one else in her life, she can turn to her education and support her children, support herself and nurture that next generation on. So I don't think pushing for education for young ladies is strictly a one track. I think it's a guarantee of protection uh, and the future for that young woman and for children she may be a parent of. I uh, heard a statistic, oh gosh, I think it was last week, that our colleges, it's um, 
it's 60% women and 40% men. Is that a true statistic? And what, yeah. where's, where are our men right now? Um, well, that's, I think, a question that's a little bit beyond my scope, but uh, I see that in medicine, too. Um, I still teach medical students and residents, and overwhelmingly, there are women. I think that we are telling boys the wrong messages. We're telling them. Yeah, and also, like, so I didn't talk about how the heroic feminine intersects with dating very much in this talk. I wanted us to focus on the alarming medical facts and kind of encourage people to make informed decisions. But um, there, there is, you know, obviously a huge impact on um, on how you select. Like the the feminine select. So men select their partner too. That that's a little bit of feminine in them. But for the most part, in every culture throughout all of our human history, the the woman selects the man. And so we have a selection criteria. Like the primary existential fear in a man is, am I good enough? And the primary existential fear in a woman is, did I select well? And the issue is, is that when you select, you cannot compete in the same domain of selection. So if you're, if, and I totally, you know, I, I got divorced, I'm so glad I had a job, you know, I'm like uh, back happily with someone, but it's like, I, I understand that. Like my father came to a new country and he said, I don't want my daughter to like, you know, if she, if something bad happens, like what, and we are not around, what is she gonna do? And I mean, obviously like I'm very, American, I'll be fine, I'll figure it out. But but it's like, that was a concern. But um, if if women are now co competing with men in the masculine sphere of, of education and career, and it's not about, it's formal education. Women have always been educated. And women have always worked. We just worked more in the home or on farms, you know, with our men side by side. So it, this is really a problem of industrialization and birth control that's created a new situation. But if a woman is um, also achieving wealth and education, formal education, and men feel like, well, they're doing it now, and if there's only 100 jobs, right, and now 50 or more of them are taken by women, men will naturally have less opportunity. It's just a mathematical fact. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, women then still want to select off the top, right? And so what's happening is boys are getting left behind, men are getting left behind, because Women, you cannot select a man from the same area of like competition. So if I have achieved status, I'm not gonna select a husband based on status. I'm gonna select on godliness, compassion, something else that I admire that I want to like, you know, to basically help compliment me. But I think boys are getting left behind because they feel hopeless, because they feel like they can't compete, there's not enough opportunity. And so we have to really, I don't have an answer, but that's the problem. <laughs> so, this is beyond, I mean, that's something that we as a culture have to solve. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Any other questions? Or Just quickly, I thought it was all about the birds and the bees. <laughs> <laughs> so it isn't. No, I mean, our, our hormones are being squashed. So people, you know, it's funny because we have a more sexualized culture, right, on one hand. But people are actually having less sex. They're actually getting married less, and 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 everyone thinks marriage is where you know love and sex and romance go to die. That's the narrative. <laughs> you don't want you know like the woman to take your money or a man to control you. And it's like we're we're telling lies. I mean, I, this is studies. Okay, I mean I did, I am also a nosy psychiatrist. I do talk to a lot of patients, but these are studies that show that actually married. Um, couples, usually faith-based also, have the best sex lives. <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> so that's something you can tell your boys as they grow up, that there's incentives here, because you have to get good at something. <laughs> but it's, it's also about companionship. I mean, yes. there's more than just... Absolutely. And, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to live alone. Yes, and men are more brittle, especially as they age. I mean, women. Yeah, as, you're right. Women, as they age, we have like we're networkers. That's a feminine trait. We network. We build all these connections. So you know, if something happens, you call your girlfriend, right? I mean, yeah. And you just you figure it out. You have this whole network. And men are more or less like that, basically. I mean, men have friends, and we've also discouraged men from having their own spaces. Their spaces are, oh my God, we want to get into the Boy Scouts. Right. We want to shut down their men's lodges, and it's like, man, men have very few places to actually connect.
But men as they age actually suffer more consequences, particularly to their physical and mental health, if they're not married. So. Well, now then, we're all going to join the women's team, so. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I know. I know. <laughs> 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 Another topic. <laughs> <laughs> Another topic. Yeah. Okay.